Mother died in 1984, and when she, at this, the will, she left two names on it, my name and my sister's name. With two people on papers, you just can't get along to two things up. I feel like I betrayed my mama and my daddy because I wasn't able to keep what they got back then, which was very hard for them to get because my mother did domestic work and my, my dad worked at the cleaners. So they wasn't making anything to accomplish what they did. So I have it on my heart. But anybody's let their mother down. I think it's we in government by not providing a pathway that she can afford to rehabilitate that property before the city of Fitzgerald ever showed up saying it was a nuisance. It's referred to as air property H-E-I-R sense, but really we think of it is is so up in the air who owns it. We discovered that there was a horrible problem out there. The, the more we got into it, the worse we realized it was. A lot of people think that properties can be bequeathed to them. Uh, Georgia law does not recognize bequeaths. If it's not written down on a piece of paper and signed by the person who owns the property, then that verbal promise has no weight in law. That person who's lived on the land all those years, who's paid the taxes, who's done her best to keep it up, finds herself ousted from the land because of the operation of law, because she did not know that as someone of low traditional wealth, that she too needed a will that she too needed to protect this asset that to her was her wealth, but she didn't recognize it that way. Family members often disagree on a number of things, the least of which is how to own and operate land. And so it can create a lot of problems <coughs> in terms of accessing wealth that would otherwise be available for, uh, for people as landowners. I think it transcends the immediate owners of the property and it could potentially also create problems for communities as well. The people who are holding a lot of this property, most of them don't have a whole lot of money. Most of them don't have a whole lot of education. So they've got two strikes against them to begin with. If the title is cleared up, then the owner of the title you know, can go to the bank, can borrow money to, to make improvements on the property. And, and this house is a prime example of what can happen when it happens right instead of sitting here and just dilapidating until we have to tear it down and then ultimately we wind up maintaining the property long after the house is gone. You're able to, to work to clean up blighted property and, and to clear titles and to give people an opportunity to come and build a, a home or something on that, on that property and get a mortgage. Uh, you've transformed that community. You've, you've lifted them up you'll find that particularly with clearing white properties, the neighbors all of a sudden are out there planting flowers and adding additions to their homes and reinvesting in the neighborhood. It's an extremely positive experience. to hear the voices of the poor, the children, and the marginalized, and to uncover and end the injustices that no one should have to endure. The problem of air property fits precisely in the center of that mission. 
Appleseed has done some research in four or five counties. It bears somewhere on the order of 10% of the property in rural counties based on that limited study. It could be air property. And what that means is 10% of your potential tax base is tied up. 10% potential investment is tied up. It's like a store having $100,000 worth of inventory, but 10% of that inventory is locked in a closet. That equated to around $23 million fair market value. If you take that $23 million <coughs> just for McIntosh County and you multiply that times 159 counties in the state of Georgia, you end up with billions of dollars that is stranded investment that is not being used. Appleseed, by virtue of their existence, is bringing a focus on the problem. They have gotten the first mention of air property in Georgia law ever since the existence of the state. They have an ability to bring focus to this issue from a different direction than cities and counties can. From the very beginning of this project, DLA Piper has been at the table as a firm with individual lawyers, paralegals, other support staff willing to work with us. It's a testament to this firm backing up what it says, and we were the incredibly fortunate recipients of that kind of professionalism, that kind of ethos that obviously motivates this firm and its lawyers. One of those lawyers did stand out, and that is Shunta McBride. She was involved in every aspect of the project. And I have relied on her, Crystal Chastain Baker, the project manager has relied upon her, the volunteers have relied upon her, and she's offered her guidance, her encouragement, and her own work to make the project as successful as it has become. We are so delighted to recognize DLA Piper and Shunta McBride as the A. Stevens Clay Good Apple Board recipients. It feels very good to be recognized for something that you truly love doing, something that you would do even if no one else were looking. So I'm very, very honored and I'm very grateful. It's always an extraordinary opportunity when you can be a prototype, you can be a demonstration project. The role of the pro bono legal assistant has been the absolute key to making this thing happen. I think Apple is certainly a great way to get lawyers in heaven. But kids that make you serve well with the function. They were real nice, real curious, professional. They have really lightened a burden on my shoulder. It's incredible what is just being drained from the public coffers. And any real estate attorney is familiar with it, but nobody's been able to get a handle on the enormity of it until I was in Canada. I would like that my kids knew that their grandmother and granddaddy did build a house, and that's where it was.